Well, I'm excited today that we'll be continuing our part two discussion with Mr. Jim Lakeley, the vice president of the Heartland Institute and a longtime analyst from the United States. We're going to be talking about a lot of issues today from the upcoming United States election on November, as well as uh, climate models and whether or not we are in fact in a climate crisis, as well as issues related to censorship, all issues that matter to us and certainly our American neighbors. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. So another issue that I do want to um, get at, and, and I know that Heartland has done an awful lot of uh, research on this issue, has to do with the concerns regarding the 2020 election. In Canada, the assumption is that people who talk about the idea that the 2020 election was stolen are conspiracy theorists. And I think that does a disservice to the very real evidence and incredible work that's been done by many um, organizations and people, including yourselves. But help us understand what happened during the 2020 election. And I, and I should just note that I believe, if memory serves me correctly, there's poll after poll that shows well over half the American population believes that the 2020 election was compromised, if not stolen. Is that correct? Yeah, I've seen polling to that regard as well. So count me among those who are so-called election deniers and conspiracy theorists, because I've seen, I've covered politics for a good, a big chunk of my professional life as a journalist, and I've voted in every election since 1988, and I've never seen an election night or election procedures like I saw in 2020. I never saw the media prime us by saying there could be a red wave on election night, but hold on, there's going to be a blue uh, you know, tide coming in after that. They were priming us like, oh, we have to wait till we count all of the votes and it could take weeks. We may not know who the president is for weeks. No kidding. That was never the standard in the United States. Suddenly it's the new standard. You know, Suddenly in 2020, because of COVID, um, because it's too dangerous to go to your polling it's place. It's not too dangerous to go to Walmart. It's not too dangerous to go to the grocery store, but it's too dangerous to vote. So we have to mail everybody dead, alive, pets, uh, imaginary friends. Everybody gets a ballot and uh, we wow. will and we'll throw out like they did in Pennsylvania, my former home state. They uh, they just threw out the election rules completely and made them up on the fly that all happened to just make the ballots a lot less secure and open for fraud. And yet we're gaslit, told by our media and told by our own government that the 2020 election was the most secure election in American history. If you no. want to know why, there's a lot of Americans like me that get a little angry sometimes thinking about their country Same. and thinking about this upcoming election. It's the gaslighting. It's the lies. It's being told by officialdom and the ruling class that, no, Jim, you're wrong. You didn't see trucks um, show up in the middle of the night in, at, a, at, a, at a counting house in Detroit. You didn't see They're footage great. of people um, s stuffing uh, ballot drop boxes with, with bins full of ballots. You didn't see that on tape. Wait, that didn't actually wait, happen. Um, you didn't see any of these things. It was the most secure election in American history. And if you don't mouth those words publicly, then you are a conspiracy theorist. You actually, in the words of our own president, President Biden, are a danger to democracy. Some of the wow. January 6th uh, people that, that stormed the Capitol in a, in a four hour riot, part of, their, part of their sentencing is they had to state publicly in court that they thought they had to state it publicly. The 2020 election was legitimate and Joe Biden is my legitimate president. That's Maoist. You, you Yes, that happened, David. That's wow. Maoist China stuff. And it was happening in the United States. And so, yes, to me, you add all of that kind of stuff up. And I am with those half of, the, of Americans who do not believe that the 2020 election was entirely wow. on the up and up. Okay. 
but, but what I find fascinating about this whole debate then, Jim, is that if I were elected, and I have been an elected official, but if I were elected, I would have, and that, and there was that kind of divide in terms of opinion, like over half your population thinks that you're illegitimate. Why wouldn't you work in every way possible to lay everything out in a transparent way and actually get to the bottom of it and address these concerns? Instead, it's all about how dare you question and uh, will either censor you or will fine you or intimidate you or harass you instead of addressing the real valid concerns and questions. It could be, David, that there are no legitimate answers to those very legitimate questions. And so you call everybody who questions you and asks you very difficult questions that do not have straight answers a conspiracy theorist. You otherize them. I mean, your your listeners can can look up, you know, the so-called red speech by Biden. I think it was about a year yes. ago when he was still, uh, you know, they, they, he's standing there, two military, uh, two Marines behind yeah. him. You know, right. the columns awash in red. It looked yeah. like, it was like something out of a Horrible. dystopian movie. And he was yeah. accusing half of the United States of being, I think he, he at least softened it by saying semi-fascist because they support wow. Donald Trump or they don't support him. I mean, some of the things that I've seen happen in this country, again, everything seemed to be on fast forward because okay. the third Obama term had a four year interregnum thanks to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. You know, there's things I was he I, I hear from our president and our ruling class that I never would have thought I'd heard I would hear in the United States of America. And so maybe you're not getting good answers to those very legitimate and should be easily answered questions about the 2020 election is because there are no legitimate good answers. Because okay, so, that's the only conclusion I can have when they don't even make yeah. any good faith efforts, like you said, to assuage yeah. the fears that Americans have that our election system is broken, if not utterly corrupt. Yeah, and I, I think I, I find this very disconcerting, that kind of tone and rhetoric. I do recall Biden's so-called red speech very well. It's It's very ominous because it's almost like vilifying and demonizing fellow citizens. Uh, and and that that is not appropriate within um, free and democratic societies. And we saw that certainly in Canada when we had a prime minister that didn't even refuse to meet with the truckers who were in peaceful protest and just demonized them, even before they rolled into town, didn't even meet with them. But then in, in invoked the um, Emergency Measures Act, which has been, of course, declared now as unconstitutional. But so, so the, this is a little late this for the truckers, though, kind isn't of it? Territory. It's a little late for the truckers, you know? This yeah, is something that the ruling indeed. class does. They know what they're doing is illegal, if not immoral, and they do it anyway because they know their intent will already have effect before they're corrected um, gently exactly. later yeah. on. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, it, it, it's no, but it, it's so disingenuous. It's, it's really quite Machiavellian, if I can use that term. So in this context, Jim, is what were the key facts from your findings, your analysis? You had a team look at the election yeah. um what were the key facts that would give us pause to say well maybe that election was stolen yeah well in in 2020 we partnered with uh, rasmussen and w for a long time for for a couple months actually we kicked around the idea because we do polls from time to time with rasmussen and uh, they tend to like our questions because we we ask some pretty interesting questions that frankly somebody who's in the professional polling business may not have thought of and we were kicking around for a while the idea, how is there is it possible to craft a poll that would gauge a would gauge any level of election fraud or illegal voting? Let's put it that way, illegal voting in the 2020 election. And so we decided, well, what if we asked if voters one voted in the 2020 election, two did this act and this act and this act with their ballot? And ask them this, just admit that we won't say that that's, that those are actually illegal. These actions are illegal. We'll just ask if they did so, that or if they knew somebody who did that. And so we did. And so we sent the poll out with, with uh, Rasmussen. And, and frankly, um, I was nervous only because I thought, um, yeah, this maybe it's just going to be a dud. You know, we'll <laughs> we'll we'll pay Rasmussen to do this poll and, uh, you know, we won't get a very much return on investment because surely people are not going to admit to committing voter fraud, are they? Uh, sure, hey. We found actually quite the opposite. And Rasmussen has been doing polling for a long, long time. And they were shocked at the results. And so when we got it back, 
uh, 21%. So we polled 1,085 people, a, um, or Rasmussen polled 1,085 people with our questions um, with a completely accurate um, uh, demographic breakdown of the 2020 election as far as men and women, Republicans, Democrats, and independents, blacks, Hispanics, whites, geographic areas. It's, it's, they've been doing this for a long time. They know how to do that and to get a representative sample of voters in the United States. And we, what they found was that 21% of uh, the people polled said that they voted in a state where they were, quote, no longer a permanent resident. That's Sorry, illegal. Can you You're repeat that? You're not supposed that? to do that. Yes, 21%. 21%. 21% said they voted in a state in which they are no longer a permanent resident. In almost every wow. circumstance, that's voter fraud. Uh, that's illegal. That vote should be thrown out. I, obviously, this goes without saying, every illegal vote, vote cast should be thrown out and not counted in the election. Uh, 21% in the survey admitted that they filled out a ballot for a friend or family member. Now, that may have been innocently done, but in most states, almost all of them, that's illegal. Yeah. You're, not, you're not allowed to do that. 17% said they signed a ballot for a friend or family, family member, quote, with or without his or her permission. That, it is a felony to sign a ballot that is with your, you know, that is not yours. The intent, the and then you you add on in you add into this, as I mentioned before, in because of COVID, we have to throw out all the regular election rules, uh, mail everybody a ballot, and then basically let Democratic operatives scour the country and bring them all in. Um, and that's why we were told by our media the election's not over. Um, it could be not over for a few weeks while they count up all of these ballots. Um, yeah. So when you add all of that in, this this poll that we released in December, it really made big news, and uh, um, it's still making news today. And it shows it. that the 2020 election was very far from the most secure election in American history. And it, and it could never have been the most secure election in American history when millions upon millions upon millions of ballots were mailed out um, all across America with no regulations, no no signature verification in almost every in, in almost every case. Uh, and so it. we just did the poll and people admitted that they basically committed one of five different versions of voter fraud. Yeah. Well, it, it all strikes me as a former elected official is is almost like um, no offense to banana republics, but like a banana republic, because we, we should be able to count our elections within the day that yes. votes are cast. We shouldn't have electoral weeks or months or seasons. They should be pretty straight up, notwithstanding a legitimate um, absentee ballots. But this whole mail-in business is just uh, strange because you can't have proper ID. I mean, the the, the, the the gate is totally wide open to fraud. And, and, and I think even if you don't believe that there was specific fraud undertaken, the enormous amount of the public in the United States, namely half of them, don't believe it was legitimate. That is a problem it in is. a democratic society because if people don't believe an election is legitimate, they will um, distrust everything that you're doing and they will believe that they may have to take alternative measures, even violence, if they believe their backs are up or against the wall. Is this not, th this is a very important issue, Jeff. This is. It's the most important. I think election integrity is the most important issue um, in both of our countries right now. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons people, again, I, I, I want to believe that my country and my government is legitimate and that they're looking out for the betterment of we the people. Um, I Indeed. want to believe that, but I keep seeing in front of me evidence that I don't live in that world or to think that way is to it's live fun. in a fantasy world and not the real world that we live in today. I mean, the state of Florida had a ton of mail-in ballots, just like every other state. Um, they are the third most populous state in the country, I believe, after California and Texas. They had their entire election counted up that night or the next morning. Mm -hmm. Isn't it yeah. weird how the only states that took weeks upon weeks upon weeks to count up all their ballots were just the swing states that were needed to decide the exactly. election in favor of, of, of Joe Biden. Now, that is a yes. question that I have been raising for four years, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I want a good answer <laughs> for it. I want a better answer than, well, that's just how long it took. 
that is not a good enough answer. Not in a country right. in which the, it's very, very important for the people to have trust in their election systems because every single fake ballot that is that is counted that should not have been counted every fraudulent ballot every illegal ballot that is that is counted takes away your franchise not you know the franchise from some guy <laughs> somewhere <laughs> you the american people should be thinking as i do that every one of those takes it away from me my franchise my birthright my liberty is under threat every time our elections are com are run like complete circuses it's a <laughs> joke and you know, I, I've said on another podcast, it's a very sad state of affairs that in Iraq, post-war Iraq, where you would dip your finger in the purple ink and put your finger up to the camera, that post-war Iraq has runs better and more secure elections than the United States of America in 2024. Wow. That's it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And it's also, as you said, David, dangerous because when when That's people it. do not believe that um, when they believe that they are ruled and they are not, as opposed to being represented in their government, that they are not free people, that they are subjects. We're right back to where yes, we yeah. were 248 years ago uh, because that's dangerous. Those were dangerous times then and would be very dangerous times here in the United States or Canada today. Yeah, well said. I think you're absolutely right, Jim. So if I had to switch gears then a little bit to areas of policy and we mentioned about climate change or the uh, you know the invocation that somehow there's a a climate crisis all a Greta Thunberg with her finger waving at us saying the world's going to end is there another game going on Jim as well like we know that the 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 scientific models even proposed by the UN panels are really looking at one degree uh, over some 80 years. I mean, it's it's almost bizarre, the, the kind of modeling problems, and you know them uh, better than I do, Jim. But in that context, do we also have a cynical game being played by, what's the term, rent-seeking billionaires? <laughs> uh, I, I, I think of, like, there's all the, quote, alternative energy is all a subsidy game, a mm -hmm. subsidy game to get money from the government, like windmills, solar panels and all the rest. And we know that they're all based on, quote, fossil fuels anyways. They're not reliable. When the wind doesn't flow, you, you have a problem. Um, they're intermittent. Um, there's enormous issues. So is there another game going on here where people are making a lot of money uh, when they know well that this is not the long-term solution to our energy needs? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, what's, what's the... What's the kryptonite to the ruling elite? And not just the political ruling elite, but the corporate ruling elite. It is yeah. a free, prosperous, happy people. And uh, cheap energy, as we've always had it and known, is a key component to having a free, prosperous, and happy people. Um, yeah. And so now we are artificially increasing the cost of energy because that's, it makes it easier to control people that way. If you control energy, you control everything, literally everything. Um, so, so energy is the number one avenue to control. And so how do you justify <laughs> controlling and fundamentally transforming, to use a phrase, our energy system around in the United States, Canada, and around the world? You do that by telling people that if we don't immediately and radically change the way we produce energy uh, away from coal, natural gas, uh, you know, basically fossil fuels, but coal, primarily coal, natural gas, and nuclear uh, nuclear so. energy, of course, which isn't a fossil fuel. Um, the only way we can save the planet is to function is to is to trans uh, you know transfer away from that and into all of these, as you mentioned, the solar, the wind, which is unreliable, okay. which is expensive. Um, but if we don't do that, the world's going to end or we're going to ruin yes, the planet. Yeah. So we must do it and we must do it now. We must do it now. There's always this sense of urgency. Um, yes, yeah. So one of the things the Heartland Institute works on and why we're known globally as the number one think tank around the world pushing back on climate alarmism is because we work with some of the world's most prominent scientists who have looked at the data and say, human activity is not causing a climate crisis. And it is getting it's warmer, not. sure. But what? it's fine that it's getting warmer. And humans are actually not the ones driving it. There are all sorts of other factors that are driving this in here. So they're driving uh, climate change because the climate is always changing. 
And okay. so the idea, so so we are always attacked by the ruling class and by the elites and by the left um, because we are punching holes in the in the scientific quote unquote scientific That's justification it. for completely transforming our energy system. Okay, because so there isn't a consensus on Greta Thunberg's thesis that we're all careening to an end? There's a consensus among... <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to say it. There's a consensus among bought and paid for um, sock puppets um, for the elites who call themselves scientists. Wow. Um, there is no, so there is a the, lot. You can make a career and, and a good bit of money by going along with the climate scare. You don't wow. make any money or get any prestige by going against the climate scare. Okay, um, but, and that's but to the be clear then, so, so you don't think carbon dioxide is a pollutant? It's absolutely not a pollutant. The pollutants are scrubbed out of it before it gets emitted into the air. That's like, you know, Insane. the whole California air standards, for instance. Every car in the United States has to adhere to California's very clean tailpipe emission standards. Okay, fine, we'll do that. And yet you still okay. call it a pollutant. But CO2 is the is the gas of life. It is not a pollutant. Okay, but in the meantime, Jim, shouldn't we just all sign up for electric vehicles um, that are subsidized by the state and, and just drive electric vehicles and we'll be all okay? We don't have to worry about it. You keep triggering me here, David. You're going to get me mad now. Sorry, you're, you're, all my topics that get me upset. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, no, electric vehicles. I mean, that that's a whole scam on its own. I mean, actually, I just saw this morning uh, Apple, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the most the, the, the most capitalized Isn't company it? in the history of human civilization announced today that they're giving up on their dream of making an electric vehicle. Oh, is if that right? Richest, Even Apple? Yes, just today, okay, yeah. Okay, because last was, week it was Mercedes that is yep, Mercedes changing is its done. whole lineup away from EVs. And and and, and how are those um, electric vehicles, the the Ford F one fifty, selling, uh, Jim? Not well. They are they are they are not well. They're not selling very well. In fact, you know, one of the one of the um, the only I've only been in a couple of electric vehicles, and one of them was a Tesla. And it is a neat little piece of technology. I, don't, I don't actually yes. don't even consider it a car. I consider it a piece of technology. <laughs> it's like a very <laughs> expensive toy to me because it doesn't feel like an actual vehicle. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a car. I'm old fashioned that way. Um, but Elon Musk actually doesn't hasn't really made his fortune on making Teslas, making electric vehicles. He makes <laughs> his fortune by selling uh, credits to other companies that don't make electric vehicles. And so the bad news is, is that as the electrical vehicle, as the electric vehicle market, and the mandates start to dissolve or collapse under the weight of their own absurdity. Um, that's going to cost Elon Musk some money uh, one day. But you know, he's a trillionaire; he can handle it. <laughs> Just keep going to space. I'll be happy and okay. own Twitter. Let us free. Let us speak freely. I'll give him uh, two big kudos for that. Exactly. Well, um, Another issue I'd like to reflect on with you, Jim, because we're covering a lot of ground here, has to do with the whole concerns around censorship. We know that in the United States, you have the Second Amendment. In Canada, we have a long history going back uh, some thousand years regarding the importance of freedom of speech. Um, that's foundational for any, I would argue, not just democracy, but a prosperous economy as we need innovation and we need to be able to have healthy debate to be able to to move our economy forward. And I think the last, what is it? It's hard, it, it, it's gone so quickly here, but the last year has really been quite a revelation as Elon Musk um, acquired formerly Twitter and he finds all these really, frankly, in my opinion, criminal documents showing uh, the fingerprints of US agencies all over censorship on every issue. I mean, it just goes from, from bad to worse, like there's just a rolling set of revelations coming forward. And, and it certainly matters to us as Canadians as so much of our news, including the rest of the world, comes from these massive social media companies where governments, U.S. governments, were threatening to take away their licensing, putting on massive multi-billion dollar penalties on them if they didn't narrate certain opinions regarding COVID-19 to what is it again? Oh, climate alarmism to all kinds of topics. So is that a situation that is is seeping now into the consciousness of the minds of Americans, Jim? Are they realizing that, wow, we've got a serious information problem when the government is is pushing censorship everywhere it can? 
Yes, yes. And let me just let me have correct you real quick. You said the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is our right to bear arms, to have guns, which Sorry, I know you Canadians are not amendment. big fans the of either. The First Amendment. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. The First yeah, Amendment. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> you're going to fail. Your, you're failing your citizenship uh, ship test here, David. Not, not, I'm, I'm going to have to recommend you're not allowed to come in the country now. So that's a good uh, city. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the First Amendment. Uh, one of the reasons I, despite, you know, basically running Tesla, I don't, Tesla's fine, but all stuff, but Elon Musk, he's, he's now public enemy number one in the United States because he Elon is, Musk he, is Elon Musk is. Yeah. He's enemy number one. In the Wait United a second. Right I thought he was a hero, Jim. He's producing electric vehicles. He's doing the SpaceX. Like you wouldn't believe he's doing all kinds of initiatives on, you know, every area of technology. It's really astounding. I thought he was a hero. Nope, the deep state has been weaponized against him. He probably has four different government investigations against him and his companies at the moment, and it's because he bought Twitter. Uh, and he bought it because he says that he, um, as a naturalized American citizen, uh, he's originally from South Africa, um, that Canada. he is a free speech absolutist. Uh, and that makes him a radical and dangerous person in this in this country. Oh, my. Where, wow. as, um, where not that long ago, and you know, I was a journalist by training. The First Amendment is very important to journalism. It's actually important, indeed. But it's important to everybody. It's not just journalists who enjoy First Amendment protections. It's citizens and everybody else too. But um, you used to not have to call yourself a free speech absolutist. It was taken as a given, as an American, if, that you believe Definitely. in free speech. And the First Amendment only exists to protect speech that people don't like. You don't need a First Amendment so, to protect speech that goes along with the herd and that everybody would agree with. That's, that's right. not why the First Amendment exists at all. Um, and so, you know, we now live in a society and this, you know, goes into the education or I should say indoctrination of Gen Z and uh, millennials in this country. I'm Generation X. Probably, you know, that's probably why I'm so cynical. But we may have been the that, last generation to get a pretty you know, a decent just, public education in the United States. Because if you look at polling, younger people today, millennials and Gen Z, they don't put any value at all on the First Amendment. They think that if you say something that offends someone, you shouldn't be allowed to say it and probably should um, be subject to punishment for it. Wow. Um, so, so, the, so, and then you, you, put that, you put that aside for a moment and get back to what you were talking, talking about before. The First Amendment prevents the government from censoring Americans. And Percent. our government in the United States has been violating that principle ever since um, they got Donald Trump out of office. And, Percent. you know, they've done that through intermediaries, which is our media companies, but especially our social media companies, by banning speech that the regime does not approve of. Oh. Specifically and explicitly and through meetings, the Twitter files that Elon Musk uh, released after he bought Twitter. Um, and he did this independently through real journalists. He gave them the data, gave them the information, and let them write about it and release that information to the world. Showed how the most important free speech platforms in the world were coordinating with government to suppress the speech of anybody who disagreed with government narratives, be it on COVID, be it on climate change, um, be it on, oh my gosh, the 2020 election, um, to the point where, you know, even inconvenient news that is real and legitimate and true is suppressed um, because it is Repairs. would reflect poorly on Joe Biden. So when well, I when I talk about is, how uh, it seems like things are falling apart and there's like operation chaos going on in the United cool. States, this is all part of it because it is an all fronts assault on the American ideals of self governance, but especially of free speech. And that's I why agree. I think the 2024 election actually is really important in that it may not it may not actually change anything. I would hope it would. I would hope it would. But maybe it doesn't change anything even for the long run. But at least it might slow down or stop this absolute that's breakneck right. speed of, of anti-Americanism that is happening right now. And maybe that little bit of breathing room will give people enough people a chance to see what's going on and make sure that we stop going in that direction. And, and restore, have a restoration of the American ideals of liberty and freedom and free speech and that your politics do not define you and that disagreeing with somebody doesn't mean that they're evil 
Uh, you know, these are things that we used to take for granted in the civilized West, us Americans and Canadians alike, but especially you polite Canadians. Uh, and we've really lost that in the United States. And uh, I think we, we need to get it back. But the foundational, uh, the foundation of getting back to that is a proper respect and application of the First Amendment, which is for us, not for the government. I, I think you're absolutely right, Jim. Uh, what a brilliant summation and really the call for a renewal when it comes to those uh, values and its application. And and I did want to share a clip from you. Uh, I, I know that you're familiar with uh, Laura Logan. She mm -hmm. gave testimony just the other day in front of a um, kind of a rogue Senate committee uh, by the great Senator uh, Ron Johnston. And uh, she talks about this information war. We live in the age of information warfare, where propaganda is not simply a weapon it is the entire field of battle. This is a war for our minds that is aided by advanced technology, and we have never been here, not in all of human history. It is a moment when we as journalists should stand together, united, and regardless of politics, we should fight for the truth, and we should fight for freedom. Yet, not very long ago, we allowed one of our own, Tucker Carlson, to be branded as a traitor simply for doing his job. In fact, there were many so-called journalists who were leading the charge against Tucker, accusing him of treason for the simple fact of interviewing the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin. And to my knowledge, there was not a single legacy media institution that spoke up. This was more than a politically motivated attack on one man. It was... You said you've been targeted over the last 10 years. <clears throat> Can you describe what precipitated your targeting? Yes, um, reporting the truth about Benghazi. I was attacked by one of those NGOs that masquerades as a nonpartisan watchdog in violation of its 5013C status. It occupies a highly partisan position. I'm talking about Media Matters for America. I'm sure there's many doctors in this room, scientists who've been attacked by the same people. Um, the same people that run that, David Brock, for example, another political assassin, now runs an organization called Facts First USA, which is designed to make sure that your research, Dr. Hazan, never reaches, never reaches the people or the public. There are other organizations like Defeat Disinfo, which claims to be a PAC that goes after disinformation, particularly set up to target COVID and throughout COVID with General Stanley McChrystal, and the other people that advise that organization. But what, you know, Senator Johnson, it's not a secret that these organizations exist. What is not widely known and talked about is that it's paid for by us. It's paid for by the taxpayers. In your omnibus spending bills that get shoved through the House and the Senate against the will of the people of this country, they are, there are cutouts for these NGOs. And what they do is they launder this money, they pass it from one NGO to the next, and in the name of preventing the spread of disinformation, they censor, silence, intimidate, and punish. I said that this is a death sentence for journalists. It's how you murder a journalist without killing them. It's how you murder a scientist without killing them. It's how you murder a doctor without killing them. It's how you murder the vaccine injured when they haven't died yet. It's how you finish them off and everybody else in their family. And it's time for people in this building who come to work every day here who's to serve us. This is the only country where we the people are the government. This is a government for the people, of the people, and by the people. And the same is said for so-called journalists. So I think that's a very powerful clip. And I think it's a, a, um, an analysis that that complements your own, Jim. You're a former journalist. You watch this very closely, what's going on. But I think what a revelation there is that Laura Logan identifies, as you did, the funding by parts of the administrative state of all these different proxies, these agencies. So you have this particular merger of the state directing these proxies to undertake the dirty work of censorship. Um, is, is that your analysis as well? Yes, it is. And in fact, uh, I believe case law in the United States makes no distinction between government imposing censorship or government partnering with a with a intermediary 
to enforce censorship. The, the point of it is that government is not permitted and, and it's, it's not even supposed to get within a thousand miles of, of saying that people can't say what they want. Um, and so, you yeah. know, what, and how they do this, again, is they funded these organizations, these so-called fact-checking organizations, um, as Laura Logan just mentioned there, of um, so-called misinformation and disinformation. How often have you, have you David, and your listeners been told a, a certain notion or opinion or even fact was misinformation or disinformation only to learn, so, oh, I don't know, six, eight months, a year later. So oh, in fact, you know, that was actually hundred percent correct. Um, you can, you exactly. can say that on any topic from politics to the climate, to, um, uh, you know, to COVID, um, and the vaccines. Shit. And I'm going to keep saying all the words that will get this video demonetized, but I'm going to do it anyway, <laughs> because that's what free speech is but, about. And, uh, it. you know, so what they do is they label something that is, that the ruling elite, the regime, the government, whatever you want to say, any information that people might hear and, oh my gosh, might believe that runs counter to the plans of our ruling class has to be classified as mis or disinformation. And only they are the arbiters of those things. Um, when in fact, um, it, it's, it's like we are living in the upside down or in some kind of bizarro so, world where everything that is true is a lie because so-called true is a lie and everything that was a lie is true shit. um you know it's it's almost almost entirely the opposite you know it's the uh from from this topic to that topic i mean it's it's the by what that uh, i should say what i mean by that is that the number one purveyor of actual disinformation and misinformation were the government agents, especially when it came to COVID. Uh, you know, it was not people allowed to speak on their own about treatments or vaccine efficacy or the, the wisdom of shutting down schools. Um, all of that kind of talk, just ordinary talk that people would do suddenly became quasi illegal in this country. And as Laura Logan said, be, you know, depends on what you do for yeah. a living, but being deplatformed and canceled is a, can be a professional and even personal, um, death sentence for, for a lot of people. Okay. Um, but the ruling class has no problem ruining people's lives just for speaking their mind. And it used to be you know, inconceivable I that an American would, would consider that at all. I mean, I'm not that old. I wasn't. I wasn't an adult in the 1950s, <laughs> but I do remember the 80s and 90s pretty well. And it used to be we lived in a world where you could say what you want, somebody could disagree. Yeah, that's fine, and move on with your life. It is very telling, I think, David, that the left and the ruling class and our media, all of these people that are coordinating together and they're very well funded, they are scared to death to allow people to say what they want. They are scared to death with the notion that they might hear information that goes against their messaging. Uh, to me, and I like when I am occasionally optimistic about these kinds of topics, that tells me that they are going to lose in the end because the truth will, will uh, you know, as they say, the it's truth in. will out. And, uh, you know, but it, they're acting like they are scared. And if they're so, scared, that's got to be good for our side, right? Yeah. That's right. Well, Jim, what you're saying is very powerful. It reminds me, especially now this week, where our federal government has introduced a online censorship bill that gets at different issues, including what is so-called hate speech. And this reminds me of the final chapter of the famous book by Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, On the Road to Serfdom, where he talks about the death of truth that this is a time where state authorities always weigh in and say, this is the official truth, all in 1984. And this is the time that we're at, is it not, Jim? It is. Um, I was remembering, as you were saying that, David, the, um, uh, the former prime minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, another WEF acolyte. Uh, there's a clip out there on, you can find it on Twitter and, and YouTube, I'm sure, where she was um, absconding the public to only believe if, if the government says it, then you know, it's the truth. And if you're hearing it from somebody else, that's not the government, then that is not the truth. I mean, blatantly saying it out loud like that. 
And it also reminded me, I think it was Social Nitsin who said that, uh, uh, well, one of those Soviet dissidents that, uh, you know, it is, a pr- it is a pretty big deal when the government tells lies. That's important and you need to counter that. But you know they have real power when they can make you lie and then make you believe those lies. That's where the real power then, comes in, making otherwise indeed. free people mouth those same lies. And we were, Therefore, I think, pretty dangerously close to that, if not already there in the United States, um, especially when it came to COVID and other um, so-called you know, off-the-table topics that people were afraid to speak their minds to the point where they were, they were, they were saying lies to their own families that, you know, it's a good idea that we close the schools. You know, it's not yes, that big a deal that, you know, Johnny was yes, kept out of school and is now a grade and a half behind where he would have been. We'll, we'll manage. Uh, yes, when, when you get to that point as a society, uh, then you're in real trouble. Indeed. Well, and, and I think there's another um, insidious angle to this, and that is, of course, the world of technology. If we look at the use of uh, TikTok, which is clearly a, a, a driven device or platform um, owned by the, the Communist Party of China, mm-hmm. that has significant implications on what a particular group, namely uh, young millennials, see. I mean, there's other age categories as well. But that's well known that certainly after October 7, all of a sudden we saw particular messages being pressed uh, that uh, were, were very um, uh, focused against um, Israeli positions and, and in favor of Hamas, of all things. But we also know that people spend a lot of time on their so-called smart devices, and this has a huge impact on the information that they see. So using our critical lines is, is more important than ever. And I think of the, the incredible pioneering work done by Dr. Robert Epstein around the Google algorithms and what one searches for and what actually comes up says everything we need to know when it comes to how these information technology platforms are utterly compromised for political purposes. Is that a fair comment, Jeff? Yeah, I would use the word corrupt. I think the word corrupt applies to right. so many of the you know power structures in our society, be it a private corporation power structure or a governmental power structure. Um, yeah, Google um, Google is is a mess. Google is 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 ideologically captured. There are so many of our elite institutions in the United States, and I'm and I'm sure in Canada, sadly as well, mm-hmm. that have been ideologically captured by the left, by the academic, radical, um, you know, un-American, un-Canadian left from in the United States, from Hollywood to academia to our medical schools to our psychological societies, okay. to our media, every every powerful institution, an influential institution in the United States is pushing a radical leftist agenda. I know that sounds crazy. Per I same. know it sounds, Jim, you're, this is another conspiracy theory, but if you can name for me a powerful, influential uh, institution in the United States that is not controlled, um, that is controlled by conservatives, for instance, per I'd same. like to hear it. And but okay. most of them are 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 are, uh, are controlled by radicals on the left, not not liberal institutions, yeah. not just guys that you know, um, are little hippies or you know they just think more freely mm-hmm. and all that stuff. Right. Not those kind of liberals back from the nineties. Yeah. Like, we're talking radical Marxist leftists that control some of the biggest institutions in both of our countries, and that includes no, I, I think Google. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's a very challenging question to answer. So. Uh, We'll leave that with our audience. And see, in the meantime, then, we're confronted uh, um, with the the question of lawfare. We have, um, which is the whole art and science, if you will, and it's been used for for some time, but much more recently, as a way to use the law, to weaponize it, and to, in effect, uh, put into prison uh, your political opponent. Uh, Stalin, Mao, uh, Hitler were all very adept at this. They were all leaders from the left, of course. Uh, people may not realize, but Nazis saw themselves as socialists. But in this context, they used lawfare to get rid of their political opponents. Is that exactly what is happening to Donald Trump, orange man bad, as they try to put him in prison for 900 years? It is exactly what is happening. 
uh, and it's a continuation of what is, uh, what's been happening to Donald Trump. Uh, basically, since he came down the golden escalator at Trump Tower uh, to announce his run for president. I mean, well, we, in fact, our podcast in the tank tomorrow on the Stopping Socialism TV channel on YouTube is going to be going over uh, hammer and tongs, the uh, kind of the, the timeline and the, the extent to which the, the, the deep state and the government has been government agencies have been weaponized against him because well, he is frankly considered obviously considered an enemy of the state because he was a complete outsider. That's the thing that really shocked the world. Um, (laughs) If you look back at, it makes me laugh. It really makes me smile. The, the sadness. And there were members of Biden's administration who were in the background crying in the Rose garden uh, after Donald Trump had won. I don't know. You'd have to have a heart of stone not to not wow. to smile at that kind of thing. But <laughs> okay, but, so so this is something that you will almost never hear in the Canadian context. Really? So Donald Trump, you you don't see these as legitimate charges. They're all, uh, pardon the the pun, trumped up charges. They're 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 fake charges. They're twisting the law. Yes. To pro- prosecute, they're not prosecuting. They're persecuting a former president because yeah. he represents obviously an existential threat. So what is, why are they doing this? What they're playing obviously for all the marbles. So what are all the marbles? Why would anyone go to this length to, to persecute someone? I think because he is a danger to the entire structure. He is a potential. He's such a potential danger to the entire structure of power. That the that frankly the ruling class and the ruling elites in the United States have spent decades establishing, cultivating, and and making more powerful. I mean, the the biggest power of the deep state was that nobody knew about it, that they were able to affect the lives of yeah. men without anybody knowing that they were there. Um, and the election of Donald Trump expose them for people to see. Now, I, I think part of it is there's just straight up tr- derangement syndrome. It just yes, yeah. triggers it just triggers some some animalistic synapse goes off in their brain and they can't think logically anymore because, oh my God, Donald Trump, I can't believe it. God, God, I can't it's believe not. it. Hillary was supposed to win. It was going to be this great historic thing. They've just it's never it. gotten over that stuff. But it is very clear that the, that the um, judicial system has been weaponized against Donald Trump and the and not others. And all you have to do is see if these laws that are being applied to Donald Trump have ever applied to anybody else. Um, no, no. You know, you can take the classified documents case in which it's okay for Biden to have them in boxes next to his, you know, in, in broken down boxes in his garage next to his beloved Corvette well, uh, in the same house that his meth smoking son was, was meeting with uh, international business partners. Uh, you know, that's fine. Hey, just give them back to us. We'll be cool. Um, and but, oh, and we won't even mention that Joe Biden as vice president had no right to any classified documents ever in his entire life, ever. He was a senator and he was a vice president. He's not entitled to have possession, personal possession of any classified documents. Hey. He should have been arrested just for that. You could at least make the argument that as a former president or president, Donald Trump is the only person who's allowed to have basically whatever classified Indeed. documents yes. he wants in his possession. Right. But then just yeah. one other case, the um, the case in New York City in which Donald Trump, I think he had to admit in court today that he frankly doesn't have the cash to pay $400 million just so he can appeal the BS decision that was just handed down oh to him gosh. by a kangaroo oh. court in New York. He was charged with, with uh, civil fraud, I suppose, because it wasn't criminal, but charged civilly for taking out loans with banks paying them back with interest. There was nobody harmed by this supposed scheme to defraud banks. The banks actually testified like, you, this is crazy. You shouldn't be doing this. We actually made money on the deal. This is fine. They, they fined him $400 billion or more for claiming that Mar-a-Lago, which he was using as collateral, was worth Shit. way more, was, was not worth nearly as much as he said it was worth. The judge just decided, I think it's only worth $18 million, not the $300 million you said it was worth. And then, again, this is where citizen journalism comes in. 
on X, oh. I saw somebody just, they pulled up on Zillow for crying out loud, the property next door, like a condo next to Mar-a-Lago. Yes. A tiny little parcel w- itself was worth like $3 million. Wow. Mar-a-Lago is like 43 acres or something yeah. ridiculous like right. that. And as the well, guy and, commented and, and, on and, Twitter, the furniture and, in Donald Trump's house is worth more than $18 million, <laughs> not, not let alone the land. And so right. we have our, sis- our, our court system is now, it's a persecution system and it's being used oh. to try to prevent Donald Trump from from winning the presidency again. And then we see um, more deep state actors or the judicial system being abused to try to illegally keep him off the ballot in several states. And yes. again, if all of this effort is being made to keep Donald Trump from being president again, it makes me wonder, like you, why? And I hope for the sake of the United States, it's because the prospect of his election as president again would be so dangerous to those who are those powerful Good. interests, both in government and out, um, that that's why they don't want him to be president again. Well, that makes me want him to be president so we can see if that's true. And if it's true and he can break up that power center, I think that's good for freedom and for most ordinary Americans. Wow. Well, I think what you're doing, uh, Jim, is is confronting us with the question, what is really all at stake in driving this? Uh, I mean, this is like an absurd set of situations and um, the law doesn't support this. And, and I think it does incredible harm to the reputation of the United States as an advanced society when the kind of real estate loan that was talked about is done all the time. Um, and so why would anyone then in their right mind invest in New York State ever again uh, if you have this risk of politicization and someone yeah. doesn't like you, they're going to go after you. I mean, this is really quite disturbing. Um, so related to this then is also the Biden family, where there's receipt after receipt now that's coming out of the uh, the select committees out of the House that shows the kind of um, uh, monies that were involved from foreign actors. Uh, I mean, they're all there from, from the Communist Party of China to... Um, uh, what is it, uh, Ukraine to uh, all kinds of nations. It's just incredible how they used um, the selling of influence vis-a-vis Joe Biden as a way to make a lot of money. Um, so is that coming into the American consciousness as well in this next election? I think it is. And um, it uh, it ties into the censorship thing because, of course, the, the truth was told about uh, the Hunter Biden's laptop and... Uh, it was suppressed, even though it was true, um, because it was dangerous to the regime. But uh, yeah, this the, the thing that gets me about the, it's remarkable how incurious, and it shows how corrupt they are, our so-called corporate or our mainstream media that is corporate owned and corrupt, that they're not it's interested same. in what would be um, Pulitzer Prize winning pieces. Or it would be in a in a sane world. Okay. Instead, they give out Pulitzers for reporting on the fake Russia collusion story for four years. That's what you get a Pulitzer for these days, right? But well, um, but the, the only, Jim, but the only thing respect, the, we do know now, we do know now, yeah, that not only did a number of those outlets get uh, Pulitzer prizes for investigating the so-called Russian collusion um, hoax, which was was all proved to be incorrect, but that they were also paid. So oh. this is this is the other side to it. So it's amazing what money does to people's professional obligations. No, as the uh, most famous uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, story once said, "Follow the money, right?" And that's where you're going to get. Uh, in fact, and that's getting back to the Bidens. That's what they always seem to do. And the thing that always gets me about the Bidens, especially Hunter Biden, you know, making all of this money, being paid millions of dollars for what? Yes, what Definitely. what did what skills does Hunter Biden actually have? What skills does Jim Biden actually have? Where is their exactly. great, where is their impressive professional resume? The obvious answer is they don't have any. They're certainly not he skills said. that would that would warrant such exorbitant um, payments and salaries or whatever you're going to give it. It's basically payoff. Their only yeah. marketable skill, if you want to call it that. The only thing they had to market or to sell was their access to Joe Biden. That's it. Zero. That They had nothing else to offer but that. It is so obvious that to, to, to say that there's something else going on other than influence peddling is being willfully blind. Exactly. 
So we've covered a lot of ground today. And as we kind of get to the home stretch here, Jim, um, we've talked a lot about the policies, the players, and kind of the uh, incredibly dramatic and sometimes confusing world of U.S. politics. And looking at some of the deeper issues that are at stake here that really relate to really the sovereignty of people and the democratic process of this incredible country called the United States. So in that context, are you seeing signs of green shoots or hope? Uh, what are actions that you see that are happening that show that the United States is kind of on a renewal path that we talked about earlier? Wow, you really put me on the spot, David. Gosh, signs that the United States is not doomed. Well, well perhaps, Jim, as you, as you think about that, I do have one in mind. Okay. One has to do with the initiative related to environmental social governance. And you know this so well, and certainly yeah. at Frontier, we've done a lot of research on it and issued um, a lot of uh, summaries regarding the problems of the so-called woke uh, environmental social governance indexes, where they essentially want to use your money to not only pay you, uh, to get you to pay higher fees for investments, but they want to use your money for their woke causes. I mean, it's insane. We know that Larry Fink from BlackRock, among others, Vanguard have been at the forefront of this stuff. And I also know an organization called the Heartland Institute, Jim, namely yourself and so many others, your incredible team, that have been at the forefront of pushing legislation. Uh, I think of Betty Grande as well, pushing legislation to make it illegal to have ESG. And I think you've made incredible progress. In fact, I recall just last month, I believe it was the uh, Wall Street Journal who claimed that ESG is now one of the hated, most hated acronyms on Wall Street. Now, I don't know if that's a head fake, but surely that shows that there's been some progress where you've had some, what is it, 26 states now say it's illegal to have ESG funds. Yep. Okay, you just reminded me of something that makes me happy, David. And congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. I mean, and I, not to pour too much cold water on it, but uh, among the team here at Heartland that works on ESG, there is excitement and, and you know, pleasure to be gained from the fact that um, victories like this seem so rare. Um, and, you know, but there's a lot of factors at play. It's like Margaret Thatcher, who said uh, the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of people's money. And while that Indeed. applies to governments, I think it also kind of applies to the private sector, at least when you're trying to impose socialism uh, through the financial system, uh, you know, try to impose radical green agenda by picking and choosing what you can invest in and trying to use your enormous leverage as a Vanguard or a BlackRock to re to fundamentally transform, there's that term again, our finance system and the way we invest and the way we organize society. Um, you know, they're turn it's turning out that it's not super lucrative and that there's a lot of pushback on it. Um, my only fear is that they will continue their agenda, but just shut up about it. Um, mm -hmm. one of the, kind of one of the annoying things about about <laughs> about the advancements of the left on all fronts um, over the last several years, but especially during the Biden administration, is that they're not just satisfied with the victory, with the policy victory. They are not truly satisfied until they rub your face in it uh, and yeah. just make you regret ever uh, questioning their wisdom and. Oh. Make sure you know your place, and your place sure is, not, is not is uh, not telling telling us how to you know what what you should buy. Our place is to tell you what you should buy and what you should be and how you should be operating your life. So, you know, I do fear a little bit that they'll just continue it quietly uh, in the background. Um, that's still preferable than rubbing our faces in it. And so we will have to see. But you know, the good news is that actually this was mostly market. The the reason why there's been a retreat from ESG. It's not just because of uh, government legislation or state state by state legislation, although that is important. It's because there was a pushback and a rejection of it from uh, other investors, and the fact that you just can't make money on it. I mean, this it goes back to why all these electric vehicle companies are falling apart, and uh, yeah, Ford is is pulling back their their production, and they're canceling this plant and that plant and that battery plant that we're going to do. All that stuff is. Uh, you know, it's been has been pulled back because the market eventually does get a say. Uh, and they have said that ESG is a loser. And so people are retreating. And so for that, I am great. 
Yeah, indeed. And and I, I think that is part of the the paradox of a lot of this stuff is that a lot of these um, crazy policies, um, I, I would refer to them as dead end policies, are really not policies. They're they're irrational ideologies that are imposed on reality. Yeah. And over time, the truth will, what does it say, set you free. So when you look at ESG funds, we know that they underperform in pensions. So why would you do that if you're serving the people? Um, so I, I like the way you're calling it out, Jim. I think the other thing in terms of citizen action, though, is surely people need to speak up um, and they need to contact their citizen rep- their, their representatives because in the end, they are they after they are after the voter. Um and, and I think as a as an ele- former elected official, I know that does make a difference. Uh, so so keep trying. But the other thing is, are you not noticing the emergence of a parallel economy? So, I you know, we found out that, you know, so what? Disney makes all kinds of bizarre woke movies uh, for kids and others. The marketplace will speak. So go, go you know, buy a different movie that, that doesn't subscribe to that and put don't go to Disney. Like your your dollar can follow your values, but like, is that parallel economy emerging in the United States too? I think it is. Yeah, I mean, Disney is being punished severely for deciding to push an agenda instead of trying to entertain and provide, frankly, family entertainment, wholesome family yeah. entertainment, which was the legacy and the purpose, the entire purpose of the Walt Disney Company is that and nothing else. Uh, and and they they moved away from that, and I talk about this a lot with my friends and family. Actually, this this whole idea uh, of how wokeness and the left have imposed themselves it, it's like an all frontal assault. They're everywhere, uh, yeah. And but especially in our entertainment, and it's I, I truly believe that a company like Disney, you know, they get ideologically captured. That's another topic we've talked about on this on this show. Uh, and Disney has been ideologically captured. A lot of well, all of Hollywood has really been ideologically captured. And I believe they had meetings where they would say, it doesn't matter what we give, uh, what messages we have in here. These pe- the American people just eat it up. It's Disney. And so it's actually, we're, it's a derelict in our duty to make the world a better place, to not use our power in making the next Marvel superhero movie or the next Disney animated princess movie and not use it for good and for good is to is to push a leftist agenda and they really believe that the american people are so stupid they really believe this that they will just yeah. eat it up like we're mindless drones that we just stare at the screen and whatever the message is we take it to heart and uh and then that will be now that we will be able to create the america we've always wanted through disney and that's not how it works and there may not be a sufficient enough parallel economy as far as animated films are concerned, although I think that's coming. Um, what you end up with is just people will find something else to do. You know, we live Same. in a very technologically advanced age. I watch a ton of YouTube channels, which seems sounds kind of silly, but you can You're find fit. a lot of fantastic, entertaining, and smart content on YouTube. And that can take up all of your entertainment time that you give yourself for the day of a couple hours yeah. after work when you come home, right? You can watch a couple of YouTube channels Instead of watching the latest, uh, you know, Disney Marvel build or Jim, right? Or so, Jim, you could yep. go onto Rumble. You could or go onto a Rumble. myriad of other alternative platforms that are not censored. That is true. You could do that as well. So far, the ones I like, and, and the Rumble app on my TV doesn't work so great. So anyway, okay. <laughs> but you could. <laughs> the point being, you could you could find your own stuff. But there doesn't even necessarily need to be a a a big parallel society you know, uh, market out there for these things. People just go away. I mean, Disney has not made money on a single movie. Um, they had one blockbuster last year it's called Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. Every single other movie that they produced for the for the in that twelve month stretch lost money. Again, wow. like Margaret Thatcher said, eventually you run out of other people's money, and eventually Disney's just going to run out of money. And so they either got to right run those leftists out of those uh, positions of power and get back to making family entertainment, or they're going to. They're not going to be around anymore. It's a pretty tough world. So, does not say a lot, and uh, so people are are speaking up as they did with uh, what was it called again? Budweiser Light and that fiasco. Like, yep. They're still reeling from that issue in they terms are. of of capital losses. So, 
you know, there is reason to be hopeful, but we also need to um, very much open our eyes while we can open them. And we have an opportunity here uh, with you, Jim, today to get quite a um, a uh, exercise of reality therapy around the complexities of the U.S. election. And I want to thank you so much for all your leadership and work at the Heartland Institute and for spending time with us today. It was my pleasure, David. Thank you. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.